thank you vijay for your help and uh, welcome to professor shrinivas reddy all the way from i think he's in california or boston area but he's in the us uh, very delighted to welcome him this is the first uh, session that we are doing on indian classical music one of my passions one of my passions of so many of india across the world of course and uh, so delighted to have him i as soon as i saw him i saw all those great pictures of his instruments and his gurus i was just thrilled to see such a great uh, session that we are going to have today uh, he's also a scholar of sanskrit uh, let me read his bio to uh, familiarize him with with all of all the audience uh, who are joined live and who will be enjoying this webinar on from youtube and once we share on youtube on flame university's youtube channel and my channel also on youtube uh, professor shinoy already began his musical training as a guitarist and composer In 1998, he graduated from Brown University with a BA in South Asian Studies and completed his his senior project entitled Nard Sat, a multi-instrumental ensemble piece that reflected reflected his growing interest in South Asian philosophy and music. After moving to San Francisco in 1998, he met his guru and mentor Sri Partha Chatterjee, a direct disciple of the late sitar maestro Pandit Nikhil Banerjee. Since then, he has dedicated himself to Indian classical music and rigorously trained with his teacher. the traditional guru shishya style he is a professional concert sitarist and has given has given numerous recitals in the us india and europe he has three albums to his credit geeta in 1999 sitar in tabla 2001 and hemant and jog the great two great rags of indian hindustani music at least in 2008 hemant and jog in 2011 he graduated from uc berkeley with a phd in south and southeast asian studies under the guidance of professor george hart He studied Sanskrit, Tamil, and Telugu literary traditions, and completed his thesis on the Vijayanagar Emperor Krishna Dev Rai. You know the stories of Tan Tenali Ram that we used to read in our in our childhood also, and his uh, Krishna Dev Rai and his grand Telugu epic Amukta Malayada, a translation translation of the uh, the work entitled Giver of the Worn Garland was published by Penguin Books in 2010. With the same publisher, he has also released two translations in the complete kalidasa series the dancer and the king malvika agnimitram and the cloud message megdutam which is also called as cloud messenger in uh, some uh, dissension declensions his most recent recent work is raya jagannath 2020 a critical biography of krishnadev rai of vijayanagar uh, he is a guest professor of south and southeast asian studies at iit gandhinagar in gujarat india and visiting assistant professor of religious studies and contemplative studies at brown university He lives in Rhode Island and spent his time performing, teaching, and conducting research around the world. Welcome, Professor Reddy. Dr. Reddy, and over to you. Such a pleasure. Wow. Please. Thank you so much. That was uh, that's a lot to hear, but thank you. I, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I don't know who's who's out in the world. I can't see that many people, but uh, there are about twenty uh, twenty uh, more participants. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for all for being here, um, and. Pankaj ji for just organizing everything and and being a wonderful host. Uh so um we actually didn't get to talk so how long should I talk for and how long is the session going to last so I can gauge Oh, oh I think you can speak uh, uh, for 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll take question answer session if that's okay. Okay, okay. perfect. All so right. I I I really like to have robust uh Q&A so I invite all of you um to uh please ask questions i'll just present some ideas and uh some of my thoughts uh about what indian music theory is or or could be um and hopefully we can have some robust you know q and a after so um thank you again to everyone it's really a pleasure to be here i'm going to try to share my screen now and uh <clears throat> run through uh some ideas that i've been thinking about So can everyone see this? Uncle yes, yes. All all for, okay. All, for all good. Okay. So um Indian music through the ages. The idea that I wanted to present is somewhat of a chronological perspective to look at what theory as a concept um really even means and how that contrasts of course with the idea of practice and this goes across any discipline 
certainly within the Indic traditions, but you know, generally um, as a you know, phenomenon of the kind of knowing versus the doing of something. Um, and present some ideas based on the idea of music theory particularly, and also complicate the idea of what even music theory might pertain to or what, what the purview of something like what we would call in Sanskrit Sangeeta Shastra would be about. And so that's one of the reasons I chose this image to start um, because it's you know one of many depictions of chakra system aligning uh, you know, along the central channel and how much of music theory is also related to the idea of like a yogic body, the channeling of prana and vayu and the creation of sound and nada, they are all interlinked. And um, so that'll be one of the themes I hope I can try to highlight. It's just the inherent interdisciplinarity of Indic systems of knowledge. Um, and of course, in a sense, we see it as interdisciplinary because we've come at it from the perspective of this is a music text and this is a text on Ayurveda and you know, the two shall never really meet, but they do in a text like, for example, the Sangeeta Ratnakra, which we'll talk about in a little while, but basically that there's a sense of uh, learning that's uh, of disciplinary learning, you could say that's holistic in nature. So on that note, um, let me begin. Uh, with probably the foundational text, you could say, of, uh, you know, the artistic tradition writ large uh, in India, and that is the Natya Shastra, uh, written by Bharata Muni. Um, and with that, uh, that title, you know, the idea of a Muni, uh, interestingly enough, you know, there's some, some derivations of that Nirukta of that is, is, you know, the Muni is the one who's silent. And yet Bharata is the one that receives this great knowledge of, of the arts and then has all these hundreds of sons, which he, you know, shares it with. So uh, there's also a connection to silence and sound that's uh, at, at play, even in that name. And then, of course, Bharata, the very important name, of course, not related to Bharata of the uh, Mahabharata story. Uh, but, you know, Indian traditions love to have uh, root texts or like foundational texts. And you could certainly see the Natya Shastra as the kind of root text of not just music, but, you know, arts in general. Um, one important thing that comes out even in the first chapter of the text is uh, its own self-identification um, as the Panchama Veda, you know, something, uh, a knowledge that's available to everybody. Uh, all for, you know, whatever, castes or varnas, uh, uh, something that is not restrictive by nature and wants to be inclusive. I think this is a very important phenomenon, but also brings up lots of questions about art and art as a space where different classes of people are interacting. Um, so, okay, let me check the chat to make sure nothing's going on. I hope everyone can hear. Thank you, Tanishta. Sorry, it's hard for me to uh, check the chat. So if you can hold off on the chats while we go through this and then we can have a good discussion. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope everyone can see this now. Yes. So just on that note of, of what even a term like Sangeeta, which the common term that we know now is music generally, uh, what that actually means. And you, know, you have Gita there and then the prefix sum, which already has the sense of holisticness to it. Like some means that perfection, wholeness. Um, so the way the tradition looks at it is you have Gita vocal or, you know, the voice, which is really absolutely the, the foundational, um, you know, uh, principle of sound production. Instruments are, 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 are of course, in, important as a sitar player. I, I also love instruments, but they are really, you know, secondary to voice. Even instruments are trying to mimic voice in many ways. And then the addition of nritya or dance. And all of this creates what we generally think of what the Natya Sasar is about is, is dramaturgy and like acting. So, you know, the stage essentially is the place where all of these things are happening. You have vocal, instrumental, dance, narrative, gesture, all of it coming together. 
And that leads us to another fundamental principle um, within all of this artistic, you know, uh, wide expanse of artistic traditions, not just music again, is rasa, because that, that's an aesthetic theory that applies to, you know, literature, to music, to dance, to anything that can elicit some kind of, you know, pleasurable experience, um, what we would call like an aesthetic experience, um, something like emotional and powerful and in and, and the, and the most, you know, kind of uh, optimal sense of the word in, in the Indian tradition is that experience is then transcendental. Um, because you achieve a sense of shanta or peace or equanimity um, as you experience art. So these are some of the foundational kinds of things that come to us from a very ancient period. Now, dating Indian texts is very difficult, but let's say, you know, sometime around, I don't know, zero to 200 ish, there, people can really debate these texts. And the, that, that's another point is that Again, texts in India are not just a fixed entity. They don't exist exactly in one moment in time. And then this is when it was made. Things, especially texts like Nacha Shastra, you know, things get, you know, accrued into it. It grows, it evolves. And so, you know, texts are very dynamic in that sense um, in all of these traditions. But as we move on historically, we'll see more fixity within, you know, this textual tradition. So, the, I'd say probably the, the most important other music Sangeeta Shastra text that comes, you know, after, and there's many in between, um, is uh, the Sangeeta Ratnakara. Uh, this is like, I would say, landmark text. And, and this is the text I, I kind of mentioned earlier. Sharangadeva starts the whole first chapter is about Ayurveda. Um, and uh, then he moves on and proceeds to uh, sound production and the body and swaras and all different kinds of things. Um, but here I just wanted to bring up a couple of important themes in, in the development of, you know, expanding on what this idea of theory actually means. Um, so Lakshya, Lakshya is like what you want to see. It's what is expected. It's what should be. It, it is that which lays down like the propriety of a thing. And this is always enshrined in some kind of a Shastra to give it that kind of, you know, importance and, and, and stamp of authority. Um, and in contrast to that, you have Lakshana. Lakshana is what is observed and what you really see in real life and in real practice. So just this idea of the interplay between, you know, that which should be perceived and that which is perceived in practice. So the theoretical and the practical uh, in dialogue with each other. And this comes out even texts like this. And then later on uh, in kind of response to Sangeeta Ratnakara, uh, you'd see a, an even higher kind of uh, instantiation of this dialogue, which I'll draw from a, a little bit more in detail and, and quote some verses as we go along. Um, so just to run through a little bit more of the history, uh, what I call the Granta Parampara. Parampara is very important, of course, in all Indian tradition. I mean, having a lineage is foundational. And, and just as a point to make, again, not to overstress uh, an essentialization of what, you know, Indianness or Indian stuff means, but um, lineage is foundational in my belief to how knowledge is kind of understood. Um, so whatever you're learning in a traditional Indian setting is with a teacher um, and because knowledge is something embodied in a human being who kind of got this from another human being. And that linkage is really the, the heart of it all actually. Um, so even with, within, you could say scholarly traditions, this happens and it happened in India too. So Bharata Muni, yeah, I was saying around like zero to 200, so around 100, let's say. Um, and then later on, you have texts like Dattilam, again, Dattilam Muni. So it still has a, a kind of, you know, a historicness to it, although we can kind of roughly date these things, at least in a chronological um, sense. Uh, Desi is a fascinating text. Um, it develops the idea of Desi, and I'll come back to this very important term 
um, in a little while. Uh, in the 13th century, you have the Sangeeta Ratnakara. Um, and in the 16th century, a couple of cent a few centuries later, you have uh, Rama Matya in Vijayanagara writing the Swaramela Kalanidhi, which I'll quote from extensively. We had written a paper on this uh, some years ago. And it's, it's very interesting to see the way that another feature I also feel of Indian traditions is because of this idea of lineage, you're always kind of paying respects to the tradition and the gurus that came before you. And, you know, Rama Matya will directly quote Sarangadeva. And of course, Bharata Muni is the one who started everything. And all of this like homage to the past and a kind of, um, I wouldn't even say glorification, but a, a, a great reverence for the past and the truth and relevancy of the past. Um, so no one ever will say this is wrong or this is incorrect, but there's also a sense in all of these texts is as I look back at my teachers and my lineage, I also have something kind of new to say to this dialogue that's been happening. And you'll see very clearly how um, this idea of a, of a certain kind of desire to hold tra to a tradition as well as you know, advance it in some way um, comes out in a dialogue um, specifically um, in relation to the lakshana lakshya kind of theory versus practice um, debate or, or you know, conversation. Um, so I hope this is all making sense and that I'm not speaking too fast. No, all perfect. Perfect, thank you. Okay, very good. So um, now to talk about what traditionally like scholarship these days will, would probably define as classical versus folk music. And these categories of course, were Western in origin and, you know, applied to Indian music traditions of various kinds. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, stress that there are these kind of dialectic categories that existed within Indian music theory about itself. And, you know, part of the idea of talking about theory, even in general, um, is you know, our whole understanding these days, particularly within, I would say, like a modern scholarly context, you know, we're, we're fundamentally using the theoretical models that were derived from Western, you know, civilizations, where even to study Indian traditions. And the, the, the ironic kind of sadness of that is that conversely, the Indian traditions have an am amazing amount of theory knowledge um, that's very good at describing its own traditions, I think, um, or at least raising very interesting questions about them, at least, um, but also could be useful in understanding other traditions outside of India as well. Um, what's also interesting is that some of these kind of categories do overlap, just like any kind of dialectic categories can and will. Um, so the classical versus the folk, the kind of high music versus the low, the kind of yeah, the, the, the courtly, the elite versus the popular and the, you know, regional. Um, this plays out in the Indian music Shastric tradition um, in one way in the sense of Gandharva music, Gandharva music, music of the Gandharvas, celestial music, music of kind of a higher order, and then Ghana music, which is kind of like singing music, entertainment music, pleasure music. Um, and then the kind of probably the most common um, categorization, which we see also in other disciplines within, you know, Indian studies, is Marga versus Desi. And again, Marga has that sense as in, you know, celestial, as in the goal, the pathway that's set up, it's there, it's a tradition, it, but it's also soteriological in nature. That is that you're really doing this as a spiritual discipline. Whereas Desi, again, is regional, it's folk, it's popular, um, and it can be for pleasure. And, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, a, a spiritual practice per se. Um, so I'll just quote some, some verses from the uh, Swara Mela Kalanidhi. And just to give you a sense of how these texts sound and also the kinds of questions 
they raise even in their you know preliminary discussions on certain topics. So the first and most important thing is the definition of music, and this is in the 16th century, is a pleasing arrangement of swaras, of, of notes. Um, and the key word here is, I think the, the phrase in Sanskrit, if I'm remembering, is ranjika. You want something that's going to give you some kind of pleasure. So it is very important that pleasure and joy, aesthetic joy of that kind, is really, it, it's tantamount to this whole process of what music should be. And it has to be that way. And so... Within that, however, you have these two categories. So it's divided into two categories, Gandharva and Gana. Gandharva is fixed tradition with no beginning, right? It's kind of the ancient way. Practiced by Gandharvas as a source of spiritual development. Okay? While Gana is music that pleases people, composed in accordance with theories by Vage Karas, in Desi Ragas, and other forms. So again, a pretty clear, you know, distinction about what are the goals of these musics. Um, one is as spiritual practice. The other is kind of like community and enjoyment and celebration. And, and, and again, these two things need not be, um, you know, mutually exclusive. And I think that's the whole point of, of you know, complicating this dichotomy. Okay, so quoting some more. Uh, Gandharva music is practiced with an adherence to theory, but if there is no contradiction when a theory is dispensed with, then practice is paramount to theory. So this is fascinating. This is in the 16th century. Someone's coming along and saying, you know, basically we're updating theories according to practice. And practice is really the most important thing here. We really need to know what people are actually playing and not worry so much about exactly what's been written for all these years. Um, so in Ghana music, practice ought to be more important than theory. And this is specific to this popular music. But this practice should be abandoned if it doesn't create something pleasant. So again, returning to the idea of something has to be pleasing. So in this world, Ghana music progresses in accordance with practice. So he accords clearly a sense of, of more evolution possible in the realm of popular music. Um, and here is an example of, you know, Rama Matya quoting Saranga Suri, Saranga Deva, who wrote the Sangeeta Ratnakara. So he says, Saranga Suri, who is versed in matters contained in all the musical shastras considered in his chapter on instruments, the primacy of practice in Ghana music, or rather that the shastras themselves value the importance of practice. And here's the little like, you know, you know, twist where these guys can very nicely say, you know, we're doing something like updating the Shastras, but the Shastras are basically telling us to do that anyway. So we're, we're still upholding all the Shastras. Um, so these are the, I feel like the, the, the ways that a lot of these scholars try to kind of satisfy both sides of this push and pull against, you know, tradition and kind of innovation. Um, uh, the, and, and importantly, he finally comes down very clearly, uh, a Shastra that contradicts practice should not be followed. So Shastras really that, that don't really accord with practice really need to be, you know, updated, let's say. Um, while, the graha, while the laws of graha, amsha, and nyasa, and the arrangement of other swaras, the domain of the shastras, they do not contradict the basis of practice. But where that, wherever there are inconsistencies between theory and practice, this theory should again be abandoned. Like Sarangadeva Suri, who resolved this in the Desi Ragas, theory ought to conform with what is expressed in Ghana music. And here's the final you know, statement establishing the primacy of practice substantiates theory. I think that's a fascinating and powerful statement. Establishing the primacy of practice substantiates theory. And this is the relationship that at least by the 16th century um, they had arrived at. I think music was also changing in many ways. And, and this is also the kind of right before you could say the kind of great split into 
you know, Carnatic and uh, Hindustani uh, musics as kind of distinct genres. Um, because until this stage, I would say that both traditions at least would go back and still see a text like, you know, the Sangeeta Ratnakara for sure as, as, a, as a root text of the tradition. Um, so one thing, for example, um, in regard to this idea of, you know, how do you kind of keep up with old ideas, but also um, evolve and, you know, accommodate for, you know, modern practice. Um, and that is this idea of, you know, the 22 Shrutis. Often if you talk to people and they want to know about Indian music, or if they know a little bit about Indian music, they say, oh, it's so interesting. You know, they divide the scale into 22 Shrutis. That's amazing. And as a practicing musician, I'm saying personally, um, you know, the Shrutis, you know, I don't know if I can hear 22 distinct Shrutis, you know, it's not like that. Um, but I will say that we definitely have 12 Swaras that we clearly kind of define. Um, and there's different inflections and intonations of those notes, depending on rag again, and that's a whole other discussion we can have on a separate day, um, you know, with the Siddhar or something I can demonstrate. But, you know, the point is that 22 Srutis is a beautiful idea, and in this, this chart that we've made is kind of a, a, a diagram to show how that over time, um, Srutis were collapsed, you know, ideas of ranges of notes were collapsed, and finally we arrived at 12 distinct swaras, and the, you know, the Sapta swaras uh, at, at a more, you know, macro level, and those correspond very interestingly to the basic 12-tone diatonic scale or the seven notes of the you know Western scale, um, so there's interesting parallels to be thought of, and clearly, like we arrived at these in very different ways. Um, there is some speculation about you know Greek and Indian kind of contributions, but I think if you look at the historical record, you can see that you know the development of these things um, uh, were were pretty independent. Um, which, of course, then gives rise to thinking about ideas about a certain kind of universality of, you know, tones, or at least how humans perceive them, and the idea of octaves and the division of pitches within a given octave. So um, that's just one example. And of course, a lot of music theory has developed even since then, and I'll kind of touch upon that now. Um, because if we move now to another 300 years later, um, Things uh, historically, of course, have changed. We have had, you know, a, quite a clear now demarcation between uh, what we would call Hindustani music and Carnatic music. We're in the colonial period. This has influenced music in several, you know, incredible and still untold manners. Um, but you can't have a talk about Indian music theory, especially from a Hindustani musician, without mentioning the the two great Vishnu's who really are fascinating uh, human beings, um, each individually, with very unique uh, kind of trajectories. Um, and yet we're, you know, in deep dialogue with the same issues of what does Indian music mean in modernity? And what is it going to mean like in the impending kind of independence that will come and the development of a sense of a national music or a, or a history of that music and all of these large big questions that people were asking uh, both of these uh, scholar to a certain well you know Polishka more than Bhatkande but performers um, tried to develop in their lives and they both approached um, theory as a critical part of what was important um i mean the, the the kind of again there's certain like axiomatic principles that get put into place um that need to really be questioned and interrogated seriously and that is that you know a lot of the shastric tradition had a big gap because of the rise of look islamic culture throughout you know the subcontinent and a lot of the practicing musicians were Muslims who were not connected to this kind of Sanskritic old tradition. And there was a need to kind of revive this tradition. But in order to do that, of course, you need to talk to living musicians who 
carried on these traditions. So Bad Kande, for example, was very famous for, you know, going to so many ustads and, you know, asking them and often paying them um, to learn compositions and catalog this music, which is an amazing work. I mean, he really was like a true uh, ethnomusicologist par excellence. Um, and Polishkar, on the other hand, um, was more about, I think, a type of pedagogical institutionalization of, you know, let's educate people on the basic things of music and everyone should, you know, have some knowledge of this and be able to sing. And, you know, he opened up schools where you, you would get this basic training. And so they both had, you know, these interesting trajectories. Um, one of the things uh, that comes about when you discuss theory and especially in regard to, um, now a dialogue with with Western music was we were always in oral and oral, more oral actually, oral as in listening, you know, tradition, and nothing was really written down. And it's not easy to write down, you know, gamakas and means and different complexities of the melodies of uh, ornamentation in Indian music. But this is one issue that they were both dealing with. And I just wanted to show you, for example, um, two systems that were developed. Uh, Polushka's system is pretty complex and has a lot of symbols and, and things going on. And Bhatkande is pretty basic and it just basically has the Devanagari, you know, Saregama Padanisa. And basically the Bhatkande system, you know, won out just because of its, I think, ease of use. Um, and I also wanted to share this, which is also fascinating. Um, Hazrat Anayat Khan is, you know, kind of one of the, you know, important instrumental people bringing Sufi thought to uh, Europe and then to America, uh, you know, worked in Baroda for a long time and wrote this amazing book, Minkari Musica, in 1912. It's a handbook of, of, of basically Hindustani music, although he also learned Carnatic music, and you can see him playing Vina right here. Uh, Vina was really his main instrument, actually. Um, but again, a fascinating thing about another notational system, and yet in dialogue now with a typical, you know, Western, you know, uh, clef bar uh, notation. So, you know, these these people at this period, I think, were grappling with several forces and 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 traditions and ideas to think about, you know, in terms of. Where was the basis of the music historically? You know, what was the purpose of the music? Was it entertainment? Was it stage music now as it, you know, has become? Um, what does it mean to have a national music? Who plays it? What is the, you know, importance and relevance of this in our education system? These were all like these big questions these people were, were tackling and, and addressing. And everyone had their own approach. Um, but the sad reality is, you know, arts, uh, everywhere and definitely in India suffer all the time. It's so easy to devalue art because everyone loves it so much. It's like back to the, the original definition, music is something pleasing, people like it. Um, and it's easy in, in certain ways to take for granted that which is so liked. A um, Couple of other things uh, just to mention and I'll, I'll try to wrap up in a second. Um, rag, rag. Rag tax taxonomy is, you know, always a fun game to be played with musicians and, and discussing different rags and all this ragdari stuff that we love to talk about. Um, one interesting uh, part of the development in, in that field was in Carnatic music, Venkatamaki, and this was a little earlier than all these other guys, um, developed the 72 uh, Melakarta system, um, which is, of course, very you know, comprehensive. Unfortunately, there, many of the Melakarthas don't yield too many compositions or not many people have written things in those rags. It's a little, you know, big and more theoretical in nature. Whereas Bhatkande developed a tot system based on 10. And even that you could say, you know, isn't perfect in its own way, but it had some elements of, you know, uh, you know, parent scale ideas and things related to rag. So all of these, uh, kinds of things were ways of, I think, reordering things, at least in Bhatkande's uh, 
context because it was in more in the colonial period of reorganizing things um, so that they could be theorized and then you know disseminated it had to make it you know when you have like a foundation that you and so these days there are like kind of standardized things that you learn and arguably and this is again a big discussion that we had i would say the south indian carnatic tradition has remained more theoretically like linear in its progression than the uh Hindustani system, but Bhatkande and the work of other musicologists around the two, including Polishka, I think now define kind of a modern Hindustani music theory. Like we all kind of learn taught system at some point, um, you know, all, all the, 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 the rag angs, the, the, these ideas that are, you know, populated in these texts are things that are circulated now in today's, I would say, you know, theoretical discussions amongst musicians. I'm saying from a personal and practical level. Um, oh, so I wanted to end with music and also to, of course, pay homage to my Paramaguru, uh, Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, and also just relate to how um, this, you know, Marga Desi, folk classical, this stuff is constantly, you know, intertwining and moving in a way that's, you know, just mutually productive. Um, so the, the, the binaries are there for us to kind of start dialogue, but really it's about the deep interconnection that they both have. And if I could just play these, um, uh, see if it'll work. I don't know if it will. I, okay, they're, they're not working now, but if we have time later, I can play them. I'll leave with, with this one quote, which I always think about. Um, and this is Pandit Nikhil Banerjee's translation. Music is rung out of your heart which alone it is given to enchant. So thank you very much. I will stop here so we can have lots of time for discussion. Um, I hope I didn't speak too fast. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you very much for your time and listening. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Wonderful talk, wonderfully designed presentation. Uh, and uh, I think there is only one question and uh, that's by Thomas C. The question is, what are, what are the Sanskrit terms for practice and theory? Practice, uh, like prayog was the word that I was working with. Um, prayog has that, you know, yog, yuj, yujiti, like to join things. And then pra, of course, kind of engaging. So prayog is like, I feel like engagement, um, I would say probably is the nicest word I can think of, but practice is basically what that is. So prayoga, like the actual like doing of it. And then theory um, was, I think I would, what did I use? Shastra I probably used for theory. Mm -hmm. and or, siddhant. or siddhant, yes, yeah, yeah. Something that's, again, the idea is something that's defined. Uh, you know, the, the, this is the important part. I mean, Shastra comes from, well, it comes from a lot of things that can mean a lot of things, but, you know, Shastra has that meaning of that would discipline something, that which like, you know, says the boundaries of this is this and this is not this. Um, and like that, that's the theoretical part. Um, so, yeah, I would say pr Prayoga and Shastra. Uh, uh, how about Abhyasa? <laughs> that comes to my mind. Abhyasa is... Abhyasa is practice in the sense of more like, um, like riyas, like we say, okay, you know, okay. like you're like doing your sadhana. Abhyasa, abhyasa has the meaning of repetition in it. Abhyasa is about like the daily practice, matlab. You okay. know what I mean? Yes, sir. All right. Next question uh, from Satyakant A. Uh, how, uh, how do the music systems from the Far East fit into this development of Indian Western music systems? Thanks. The Far Eastern music, any comments? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I would love to know. Um, one thing I do know, um, and this is true not of, let's say like China, but also Southeast Asia also, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and definitely Africa as well. Basically any mm -hmm. music in the world, you will find at least something based on pentatonic scales. You know, mm. what we call Aldo Aldo scales. So just five notes. So, uh, you know, and, and I, know, I know that there's scales in, in both Chinese and Japanese music that are highly pentatonic that also correspond to rags. Now, I would not say that they were related though. Mm. But I would say it would be interesting to look into 
why the idea of, of just five notes seems to be a, a, a musical and universal. So sorry, that didn't really answer the question, but. Yeah, all I hear is mostly traces of Yaman and whenever I've heard Paris music, I don't know why. That's, <laughs> you, you, because you love Yaman, you hear Yaman everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. Another question from Thomas C. Uh, do these Shastrikars explicitly define Marga as path in spiritual terms? Jiha, definitely. The, so the, the, that, that, that Marga is that Gandharva path. And they, they, say, they say it's for, you know, Adhyatmika Marga. Right? You know, oh. I, I'll have to look exactly at, at the text now to see the, the word, but definitely. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the important to also see, this is what I meant about interdisciplinarity too. You have to also see the evolution of, you know, the philosophical, you know, quote unquote, religious, maybe you could say cognitive sciences, yogic sciences in, in mm -hmm. India, because, you know, you can't talk about any of this stuff unless you talk about Abhinava Gupta and what that really mm -hmm. means. Uh, I didn't get into that, but, the, you know, the idea of the rasa, because mm -hmm. what he's really positing is, I mean, in a way, the Marga guys are really talking about like yogis, you know, the typical, let's say, yogis who go into the mountains and they do their, you know, uh, sadhana and they, they achieve their siddha and all that stuff. That's one thing. Uh, but, you know, this is actually through art pleasure, you know, aesthetic pleasure that you can transcend all these emotions and then achieve this place of, you know, ananda and shanti uh, mm -hmm. that is, you know, truly something um, beyond all of this and can be very liberating. Um, so art as a spiritual discipline, and it's true for all arts. That's the beauty of it. Because art, again, falls under the basic principle of being a type of yoga. This is a nada yoga, you know? So the goal of yoga, again, is union. So Great. That how was really yeah, insightful, yes. Hmm. Uh, another follow-up question from Thomas. And how is the goal of that path then described? How is the goal described? I think you're the already goal? Already well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, take yoga, right? Yoga, yoga is a goal, union, but yoga is also a practice as in, mm -hmm. you know, joining in and doing that, you know, uh, practice in that sense of repeated abhyasa, you know, mm -hmm. what is the, in yoga sutras? Um, he says, uh, uh, abhyasa, no, no. Uh, oh yeah, abhyasa vairagya abhyam tad nirodaha. Hmm. So that, that settling of the mind has to be done with a lot of practice. And then this is interesting with vairagya. Hmm. So, so it's, it's a very interesting concept if you put it in touch with raga and rasa, what we're talking about. Like it, oh. in a way, you're creating this aesthetic pleasure, but you are doing it with complete non-aesthetic you know, aesthetic attachment. Hmm. Creating the rag and then trying to detach from it or trying to yeah. transcend it. Yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not it. Yes, exactly. So anyway, just to get back to the last point, I just wanted to say that yoga is a path and a goal. And that's the whole point of yoga is actually dissolving that idea of a goal. There is no goal. There's just, if you do it, that's it. You're there. You know what I'm saying? So the, the goal and the path are one. Mm -hmm. The same thing, practice in the theory. There's nothing like theory. It's all practice, really. Right, right, right. The theory is in the practice, then the practice is in the theory. Right. That was, yeah, that was really insightful. Also, the two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess uh, there are no more questions, but I can ask a question. Uh, you trust upon Bhatkande and Paluskar, the two giants in the modern history of Indian music, definitely. And they both are mostly. Uh, portrayed in the Hindustani or North Indian classical music. Uh, I guess you could have, probably you can uh, share a little bit from the Southern system also, who were the counterpart of these two giants the, for the Northern music. There was one part, you can please share a bit more. Second, uh, how did, did they succeed in incorporating all the Islamic contributions to our Indian classical music also? If you could touch upon that. Yeah. So th these are like two extremely important areas, which 
I also need to learn a lot more about. I mean, I would love if someone wrote a book about like, I mean, arguably you could count Rama Mathya, for example, as a South Indian. You know, Venkatamakhi, okay. who I mentioned, there, of course, is South Indian. Um, but like the colonial era scholars oh. and the, you know, I don't know uh, really who are the main characters. Oh. So I also need to learn about that. Um, so that's, you know, the, the important thing that I wanted to say about that, though, was there's more of a linear sense, you know, and not to say that there wasn't rupture of any kind. And then in the North, there was so much rupture because of different influences. Um, but, you know, the idea of, for example, Carnatic musicians mm -hmm. all learn the same compositions, all learn, the, mm -hmm. you know, there's a canon so clearly well-defined centrally oh. that, you know, mm -hmm. like you have the Trinity and everybody learns oh. <laughs> yes. the Kritis, you know, that yes. it's just like part. Whereas for us, it's like, you know, you learn some Yaman, then TK, hello, you some whatever, Bihag, whatever, whatever it is, it's it's random and it's all about your teacher. Uh, and then you have, of course, Garana issues, you know, which means exist in all positions. But uh, so what I'm really trying to say is I don't know about the South uh, period that much, but it would be very interesting to find out um, because I think there are different stories for sure, which relates to your second question. Um, Islamic influence was immense immense now theoretically again i haven't read those texts and i know a lot of people have done excellent research on that um i'll say from a, my own perspective as a you know practicing sitar player i mean the terminology that we generally use is not the shastric stuff it's you know they're usually <laughs> persian persian words that we use for gasit mean mizrab you know all these words you know <laughs> I, uh, yeah talim Riaz, all of the, the these are the I words that we, yeah so yeah um so Amazing. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, it's all mixed in there and and really yeah. you know it, 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 it the other thing is you know it, it, it's a mix that 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 was aesthetic in nature you know um, we don't we don't think about that enough you know for yeah. example you know again not to make too many distinctions north south distinctions but since i'm a southie i guess i can kind of do that <laughs> <laughs> um no, I mean, like, a Hindustani musician in Yemen, for example, uh -huh. if you're playing like a Drupadang Alap, let us say, uh -huh. okay, like, you'll, you'll sit on Shuddha Ni for like, you know, five minutes, no problem, you know, just, you know, <laughs> ni the ni, you know, just for a long time, like loving that knee. You know, and the Karnatic musician hears that and says, my God, this guy is lingering on this knee for, <laughs> for days. Where, where, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I didn't realize that. Okay, that was that. Of course, I learned a lot of new stuff from you. So that's really new for me also. All right, great. Uh, uh, I guess if you could talk a little bit on the contemporary development of Indian classical music, do you see a bright future for Indian classical music, or both for Hindustani and Karnataka in India or or beyond India or in the US? What What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, that's a huge question. <laughs> so, I mean, not to sound, you know sad about it but i i i am not like very excited about music that i've been hearing lately oh yeah let me put it that way there's only oh, a few yeah. artists that i feel like oh i'm really excited to hear this oh, wow. and you know and i also feel like the poor artists you know they're put in a position where they have to you know survive if they want to mm -hmm. And, and they have to change. And some of the change is interesting. Some, some is, you know, not so interesting. Uh, but one thing is for sure, good music always survives. Mm -hmm. because, oh, one more. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Do, do, do we have a hand up? Uh, oh, uh, I was waiting for, but uh, I- Kashi Ling. Kashi Ling, sir, ma'am. As a hand up, he raised the hand, but he didn't ask the question. He just said, "Good evening, everybody." Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I now I forgot what I was asking, but I uh, was saying. Yeah, other thing I would, uh, if you can, if I, if I can invite your thoughts. Uh, do you see in in the U.S., for example, 
do you see uh, do you think that the golden period of the indian classical music was when pandit ravi shankar and ustad alla rakha and zakir hussain and uh, ali akbar khan were all play, playing and they were like mainstream stars across the us and do you see that uh, that we have lost the golden age of indian classical music in the us or do you what are your thoughts on that i mean yeah and it's only natural i mean even if you look at the generation before them that was oh. like a golden age too oh, that was like you know yeah but yes i mean i think again art goes in 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 waves and like sinusoidal developments like anything else yeah. and after the that kind of outburst of oh. of amazing stuff and again oh. how these these artists were responding to the circumstances of their time Wow. you know the, the the whole development of a concert stage the whole oh. development of instrumental music is only like 100 years old if that not even you know oh. what i mean no one went to go see hear a sitar concert in you know in the us uh, 1920 i mean yeah. i mean yes. you know it's like you went to hear vocal if anything yeah. um and even that would not be in a big concert hall it would be at some Zamindar's house or something like that, you know. <laughs> Such a human service. I mean, mind blowing service these giants did for us for our music, right? In like 1970s, oh. long, long back, where even in the, in India probably they were not so conscious, and they were doing it in the US. How did that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the other thing that happened, right? That yeah. you know, it was done in a way that that gave Indian music automatically the stature of what we would call classical music. to bring it back to the you know very first slide you know it 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 fit all the requirements of classical music it was technically challenging it had a long history it was complex it was refined it required a kind of connoisseur to listen to it all of that um it had an elitism of its own um so you know it 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 really was ideal um amazing and you are in the same uh, lineage so you know thanks to your service to popularize indian music in the us indian classical music in the us so that's uh, great to have you again today uh, professor shastri uh, professor reddy sorry and uh, i guess uh, if there are no more questions then uh, we can just say thank you very much to you and we look forward to your visit whenever you get to come to india and especially great. to pune we are always welcoming you thank you sir thank Wonderful you thank you so much sure. Thank you. Thank you.